Good morning. I'd like to welcome everyone to worship this morning. We're glad that you're here worshiping with us. And we'd love to have a record of your attendance, whether you are a longtime member, a first time visitor, or someone that worships here on a regular basis. We ask that you would grab that pew pad at the end of the pew, complete the information therein, and then pass that to the neighbors who are seated with you. A few announcements to hit this morning. Uh, first, uh, we are going to go to the baseball game this coming Friday, and so hopefully you're excited about that. Uh, the tickets that we have are in the suite area. And so we have 20 of those. So as soon as um, it gets above 20, we'll have to get uh, general admission uh, tickets. So if you want to do that, please let some of us know uh, today or call the office this week. Uh, but that's going to be this coming Friday. You can see tickets are $10 now. Um, also, we're going to have a blessing of the backpacks, uh, not next Sunday, but the following Sunday, the last Sunday in August. And then we're going to follow that up with a trip to the Lakewood Pool. So if you would like to go, the non-Lakewood Pool members, the cost for that is $5 a person. And we're also going to have pancakes before worship. So come a little early uh, on the 28th, we'll have breakfast together, and then we'll all fall asleep together and carb crash in the uh, sermon, okay? So that'll be a fun time for all of us. Again, we're thrilled that you're here worshiping with us. Let's now prepare our hearts to worship the living God. Good morning. Please join in the call to worship Psalm 80. Give ear, O shepherd of Israel, you who lead Joseph like a flock, you who are enthroned upon the cherubim, shine forth. Sir, up your might and come to save us. But let your hand be upon the one at your right hand, the one whom you made strong for yourself. And we will never turn our back. Give us life, and we will call on your name. Restore us, the Lord, with your hosts. Let your face shine, the be peace. Come, let us worship the triune God. As you are able, please stand and join us in singing the opening hymn, number 15. We're going to sing just the first four verses of all creatures of our God and King.
please join in the passing of the peace. The peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. And also with you. Our call to confession this morning comes from James chapter 8, verse, verse 8. Draw near to God, and God will draw near to you. Therefore, let us draw together our prayers of contrition. Let us pray. Merciful Lord, we confess that with us there is abundance of sin, but in you there is the fullness of righteousness and abundance of mercy. We are spiritually poor, but you are rich, and in Jesus' case came to be merciful to the poor. Strengthen our faith and trust in you. We are empty vessels that need to be filled. Fill us. We are weak in faith. Strengthen us. We are cold in love. Warm us. And make our hearts fervent for you, that our love may go out to one another and to our neighbors. Jesus Christ our Lord. Take a moment for silent confession. Amen. Friends, hear the good news. Who is in a position to condemn us? Only Christ. Yet we know that Christ came for us, He lived with us, He died for us. He rose again to a new life for us and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. The Apostle Paul reminds us that he prays for us. We know that in Christ's coming God was reconciling the world to himself, that our old life is gone and a new life remain. So know that you have been forgiven and be at peace and pray also for me a sinner. Amen. You may be seated. Our Old Testament lesson this morning comes from the book of Jeremiah, chapter 23, verses 23 through 29. And may our God nearby, says the Lord, and not a God far off? Who can hide in secret places so that I cannot see them, says the Lord? Do I not fill heaven and earth, says the Lord? I have heard what the prophets have said who prophesy lies in my name, saying, I have dreamed, I have dreamed. How long? Will the hearts of the prophets ever turn back? Those who prophesy lie, and whose prophecy the deceit of their own heart? They plan to make my people forget my name in their dreams that they tell one another, just as their ancestors forgot my name for Baal. Let the prophet who has a dream tell the dream. But they'll let the one who has my word speak my word faithfully. What has straw in common with wheat, says the Lord? It is not my word like fire, says the Lord, and like a hammer that breaks a rock in pieces. The word of the Lord. May be seated. This time I invite the children forward for a children's sermon. question. 
Um, what all can we do with this candle? You don't know? No? Okay. Uh, can we sleep with it? Probably not. Why not? You might get burned. Okay, all right. Because it's hot, right? So if we held our hand over it, it would be hot, right? Well, I've got an idea. I want to see. Do you all think we can roast a marshmallow on this candle? I think we can. Let's try. You don't think so, Riker? Okay. Well, I just happen to have some sticks. Who wants a stick? Come get a stick. Okay. Do you want a stick? No. And I have marshmallows. Who wants a marshmallow? Do you all want a marshmallow? Yeah? Okay. Come here, Riker. All right, there's one for your stick. Get your sticks closer. Oh, goodness. Okay. All right, now, we have to be very careful with this next part. Come forth to this campfire that I have here. Okay, do you think, how do you think this is going to go? It's not black? Okay, well, it may take a little bit longer. Hold on. Let's see here. Do you want yours black? No, what color do you want it to be? White? You don't want it hot? You want it cold? You want it right now? <laughs> what do you want me to do with this? You want me to put it back in the bag? Yeah, okay, all right. We're done with that one, okay. Would you all like to toast your marshmallow? Okay, come here, let's toast it, come here. Okay. Whew. Oh. All right, we're gonna put that one in the bag. Here, give me a Okay, we'll try this one more time. Okay. I did this yesterday at our house, and it worked. <laughs> oh, there we go. Now, what? do you guys like to eat marshmallows all the time? Yeah. Pretty much, yeah, any time. We usually roast them at, at big fires. A big fire is usually not over a candle, right? Yeah, okay. Well, we really can't have a big fire in the church, so that's why we just have a candle today. But I think the best part of... A marshmallow is once it's gotten hot. I don't like them when they're cold. I don't like to eat cold marshmallows. Do you? You like cold marshmallows? Well, this is not going to make sense then. So, you only like warm ones, not hot ones and not cold ones. Okay, I can get with you. Like, but you like them black? No, you don't like them black. Okay. All right, let's see. I have to. How's that looking? You want it now? You want to try? No, you don't want it. Fair, do you want to eat it? Yeah, come here. Okay. Does it look good enough to eat? Was that good? Yeah. Okay. So the reason we're roasting marshmallows in church today is because that's the only thing that can make sense to me. The verse that I'm getting ready to read is Jesus talking to people, and he says, "I am coming to bring fire on earth." and make things better. And so the only thing that I could think of that fire makes better that we could do in church is a marshmallow. Because marshmallows, when they get warmed up, are better than when they're cold, aren't they? Do you think? <laughs> no, Riker, you don't think so? No, okay. Well, let's just go ahead and pray, and <laughs> we'll try to figure out a better way to talk about God next time, okay? <laughs> All right, let's pray. Repeat after me. You ready? Dear God, you rock, and we love you. And we're so glad that we have marshmallows. And we're more glad you came to earth to set us free and forgive our sins. We love you. Amen. Okay, do you guys want a marshmallow before you sit down? Do you want one? Yeah, okay. Riker, come here and get a rock. You want a marshmallow? No, okay. You want another one? Okay. All right, go sit down. That went a lot better in my mind than it did in practice. Turn with me, if you will, to Luke's Gospel, chapter 12. We're going to read verses 49 through 56. Oh, we're supposed to take up offering today, aren't we? 
Come back, children. Okay, take this bucket, and people are going to put change in it, and we're going to give it to people that need help, okay? Go collect the change. Okay, go collect the change, okay. There's change over here. Okay, you would think that I would have looked at the bulletin ahead of time to see what we were supposed to do there, but I forgot, that's okay. So Luke 12, starting in verse 49. I came to bring fire to the earth, and how I wish it were already kindled. I have a baptism with which to be baptized, and what stress I am under until it is completed. Do you think that I have come to bring peace to the earth? No, I tell you, but rather division. From now on, five in one household will be divided, three against two and two against three. They will be divided father against son and son against father, mother against daughter and daughter against mother, Mother mother-in-law against her daughter-in-law and daughter-in-law against mother-in-law. He also said to the crowds, when you see a cloud rising in the west, you immediately say, it is going to rain. And so it happens. And when you see the south wind blowing, you say, there will be scorching heat, and it happens. You hypocrites, you know how to interpret the appearance of the earth and sky, but why do you not know how to interpret the present time? And why do you not judge for yourselves what is right? Thus, when you go with the accuser before a magistrate on the way to make an effort to settle the case, or you may be dragged before the judge, and the judge will hand you over to the officer, and the officer throw you in prison. I tell you, you will never get, at, get out until you have paid the very last penny. May the Lord add blessing and understanding to the reading and hearing of his holy word. Let us pray. Holy and gracious God, we thank you for this, your holy text. We ask, God, that you would open our minds that we may experience this text in a new way. We ask your spirit to be upon us as we apply it to our lives. We say all this in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. I think some of you know this about me, but I'm not sure. But uh, I grew up the son of a firefighter. So my dad was a firefighter in Huntington. um, And from my earliest memories, I can remember... Uh, trips to the fire station uh, throughout the week. So dads, I don't know what it's like here in Charleston, but the firefighters in Huntington, uh, they work 24 hours. They go in at 7 a.m. and they get off the next day at 7 a.m. And so if I wanted to see my dad, you know, my mom would take us uh, down to see dad at the fire station. And I remember when he was at uh, what they call Centennial Station, number one, it's the, the typical firehouse that has the, the, the fire poles. 
And so you would go into the office and they would say, hey, we'd like to see my dad, George Boyd. And they'd make some kind of joke about my dad or something, you know. And then they would come over the loudspeaker, uh, Firefighter Boyd, to the apparatus floor. And it would be really cool. Like you'd run out of the office and you'd hear one of the doors open. And then dad would slide down the fire pole and he would be on the apparatus floor. So you could, you know, run up and, and give dad a hug or whatever. And I remember too, like being able to ride on a fire truck in the fire prevention parade in Huntington or at the Oktoberfest in Barbersville. I remember hunting Easter eggs at the fire station, uh, spending Christmases at the fire station. And it was really weird, like in high school and middle school, I would even kind of gravitate to kids whose dads were also uh, firefighters because they, you just kind of knew who they were. And, and so they were your friends too. And, and, and it's, it's this weird kind of fraternal grouping uh, of firefighters, right? So your dad, of course, is a hero, but, but literally like when everybody else is running out of a building, you know, my dad is running in to the building with water, right? That's kind of, I just always thought it was so awesome uh, for that to be the case. And it, you, you, you kind of just imagine what that's like. I, I, I can only imagine. I, I never was a firefighter or anything like that, but I know that fire's hot. <laughs> it's not something to be messed with, right? And my dad would always say, like, if we were at the fire station and that call came in, dad would, would, would always say, okay, this is not a false alarm. Like, don't follow us. Like, just go home. Um, and it wasn't really that he didn't want us to see what was, I really don't know why he didn't say it, but I think it was because like he needed to concentrate on what his job was and he couldn't worry about where his family was, you know, if we were watching dad fight the fire or whatever. And I think it really didn't dawn on me until I was older that there would be times like in the evening, my dad would call the house to talk to my mom and, and she would have to take him uh, a new uniform to the fire station because he had uh, he had been in a fire that day and it, you know, his clothes were a mess and he was smoky and different things like that. And I'm like, my goodness, like if it's enough to make your clothes smoky, like that's, that's a pretty, pretty neat thing, right? That dad was able to figure out how to, to put this thing out. So I've always been taught fire is, is dangerous fire. You have to know what you're doing around a fire, um, and in, in, in an emergency situation, like, you should probably never really, if you see a fire, you probably shouldn't go to the fire. You probably should have, I mean, unless it's a campfire. If it's a campfire, everybody's welcome at a campfire, right? But if something is burning, like, don't, don't go near it. I, I know very, very little about fire. I, know, I mean, very little about firefighting. But I do know that uh, after Jamie and I got married, we were, we moved to Philadelphia, and we were talking about this, this one place where we lived, and we thought, well, well, maybe we'll put, this is when like the metal roof craze kind of got started again, the painted metal roof. And we thought, well, maybe we'll put a painted roof on this house. And my dad said, never put a painted roof on a house. Don't put a metal roof on your house, especially don't go over asphalt shingles. Do you know why? Do I know why? I did not know why. Because the very first thing a firefighter does if your house is on fire, well, not the very first, but pretty close to the first is to vent the house of all the smoke uh, to get the heat out of the house, they cut a hole in the roof. And if it's a metal roof, the firefighter is getting on a very hot spot, uh, and they're not as safe when they're on a metal roof as they are uh, on an asphalt roof. And if you happen to have a metal roof over top of an asphalt roof, it's, it's actually even hotter. And so dad was like, never, just don't do that. Just don't ever, don't ever do that. That's not, that's not a good thing. Fires, fires spread rapidly. We, we were taught early on, keep your door closed when you go to bed at night. You've got a better chance of surviving if the fire breaks out. And we've got these little emblems that we'd slap on windows so that when our, fire, our house caught on fire, the firefighters would know come to how to come rescue us. It's amazing that I ever fell asleep, right? All these fears of like, what's going to happen when you fall asleep? Your house is going to catch on fire. But, but that's just kind of, I think, the product of having been raised a firefighter's child. Destruction by fire is bad. Avoid fire and, and have a heightened awareness of what you're doing with fire and fire safety. Now, I tell you all that to say, when I was in second grade, I thought I could control fire. 
And so I had a book of matches, and I thought it was really cool that there was a window, and I had a magnifying glass, and I thought I was going to be able to light those matches with that magnifying glass. And I never really could get that to work, but I did know how to strike the match, and so I'd spent all that time trying to get the the magnifying glass to light the matches. I just went ahead and took a match and lit the whole book of matches, and I caught my bed on fire, right? <clears throat> and so uh, I learned very quickly how uh, hot uh, a bed burns. And um, thankfully, I thought ahead, and I had a little cup of water with me, and I was able to douse it. But I have never been so scared in all my life to have to go tell my mom that I caught my bed on fire while my dad was at the fire station, <laughs> right? So, so that, that was never, that was a fun, I think it's fun now. It was not fun at the moment. And so all of these things were kind of running through my mind this week as I read this text. And I really, I will tell you now, like I struggled with how to preach this sermon. This is not the easiest text to read. This is probably the most anti-Jesus that Christians will ever feel after having read this, right? So if any of you have warm and fuzzy feelings after having read this text this morning, we need to talk because I don't have warm and fuzzy feelings after having read that Jesus is not coming to bring peace on earth, that he wants there to be fire on earth and have it rain down, right? Like these are, these are tough. The lesson begins abruptly. I came to cast fire upon the earth. It's a clear statement of judgment. Fire burns, it destroys, but fire can also cleanse and purify. The prophet Malachi would say, for he, God, is like a refiner's fire. So the image of fire is, is brought forth here in this lection, but also added to that is this weird image of water. I have a baptism to be baptized. Now, in most instances, water doesn't burn. Yes, if water is hot, it can burn. And if you put the right kind of chemical into water, water can burn. But for the most part, that's, a, that's the antithesis of fire, right? I mean, firefighters typically fight fire by putting water on the fire. So this is kind of a strange comparison in that, that Christ wants to rain down fire and bring forth water as well. Fire is quicker. But over time, water can pretty much do the same kind of damage that fire can do. Unfortunately, we've seen that with what's happened in eastern Kentucky with the floods, right? I mean, the, the, the pictures we see out west of the fire and the destruction of the fire, that's, that's crazy as well. But this, what's happened with water in eastern Kentucky, what's happened in West Virginia over the last decade or so with flooding here, it's, it's tough. And it can decompose and it can virtually destroy anything that's there. But for Christ, water and fire are images of transformation. And they're associated with the Holy Spirit. If you go back to the very beginning of, of Luke, if you go back to kind of the canticles at the beginning in the first three chapters of Luke, one of the very first lessons we learn about Christ is from John the Baptist when John says, the person that's coming after me um, will bring a, a baptism of what? A baptism of fire. And so he's going to baptize us with the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit of fire. That's in chapter 3. So it's really kind of neat that Luke has kind of carried this theme all the way through the text. So what's going to happen is there's some kind of an impurity that's going to either be burned up or decomposed and washed away. Fire without transformation is fire as punishment. And I think Probably in the years past, you may have heard a sermon preached, I hope you haven't, but maybe you've heard a sermon preached on this text where this is about God punishing earth or bringing about some sort of judgment. That's really, that's not what Jesus is saying. It's not exactly what Jesus is saying here. Jesus is not saying this whole earth needs to be scorched. It's terrible, right? This is not the same kind of text as Noah's Ark. Noah's Ark, it, you know, the craziest thing that I think we do with Noah's Ark is we put it in the nursery and we put it on kids' walls at homes, right? It's complete genocide of all existence on earth, and somehow we think that's good for a toddler. But it's a terrible story, right? So what Jesus is trying to say here is maybe this baptism that he's talking about is really about something that comes with his death. 
Jesus has been, he's been traveling, he's been, he's been on his way uh, to Jerusalem, he's been on his way to be quote-unquote lifted up, lifted up as a clear um, imagery of being lifted up onto the cross, and so Christ is on his journey to go to the cross, to be lifted up. And so when we have this, this, this strange kind of comment that he makes, it's out of this baptism that Christ can baptize that destruction will emerge and transformation or resurrection will occur. So he's almost giving us a glimpse of what it's like post-death of Jesus, this resurrection idea that, yes, things are going to be bad, but through that terrible judgmental type thing, something greater, something greater happens. That's how life works. When we lose a job in this life, we have a few options, right? We can say, oh my gosh, I'm cursed for the rest of my life. Or we, what can we say? I got to find a new job, right? Um, if, if we have a terrible tragedy in our life, we can either sit there in that terrible, terrible tragedy or through help, through therapy and different things like that, we can, we can learn ways to manage to get beyond those terrible things. And I think a majority of why people are actually probably in therapy is that there's some kind of a trauma that they experienced that they can't, to, to hear somebody say, just get over it, that's impossible, like you're never going to get over anything. It's not, it's not really how we're wired. What we experience in this life is something that will change us, and it changes and alters the way that we look at the world. And so one of the beautiful things that happens in therapy is that that you realize and, and claim what the trauma was. And then you work on ways to live your life post-trauma. Therapy is not one of those things where you're supposed to just forget about the trauma that occurred in your life. It's how you deal with it afterwards. So imagine kind of fast-forwarding in the text that, that darkness that the disciples must have experienced when Jesus died. My hope would be that one of them might think back, hey, do you remember that time when Jesus talked about the fire he was going to bring on earth? Well, clearly that's not what happened. But maybe through that refinement, like, maybe there's, gonna, maybe there's hope. Maybe, there, maybe something is going to be better. I don't know that they did that. We don't have evidence of that. In fact, we have evidence probably contrary to that. But when Jesus came back, maybe he had the conversation to say, remember when I talked about the fire and the water? Remember when I talked about that? This is kind of what I was talking about. Something bad kind of has to happen for it to get a little bit better. The sugar on the marshmallow has to burn just a little, unless you're weird and like it cold black. It has to burn just a little to get it smushy on the inside. And this doesn't make sense, right? Jesus wants the fire to already be lit. He wants that to be beyond because he knows What's happening on the other side of death? It's resurrection. And then Jesus says one of the most controversial statements. Remember last summer when I preached the sermons on the hard sayings of Jesus? Do you remember that? If you don't, it's okay. You won't hurt my feelings too much. But this is one of the ones that got left on the cutting room floor because this is a hard saying of Jesus. I did not come to bring about peace, but division. Do we need to read that verse again? Does that want to be our theme verse for our church? We do not come to bring about peace but division, right? We should always put that on church softball shirts, right? We're not here to be friends. We want to kick your tails, right? <clears throat> Jesus doesn't come to answer all of your problems in life. I've talked to you in the past about one of my, probably my favorite saint in the whole entire history of, of saints. Her name is Perpetua. She was a very wealthy uh, Roman citizen who lived around Carthage in the second century. She was a Christian. But she was also part of a family, um, as most people are part of families. But her father was not a Christian. Uh, she was captured and she was going to be punished and, and she had a child. And she also had kind of a slave person with her. The slave girl's name was Felicity. And so they were captured together. And the father, Perpetua's father, came several times before she was going to be thrown into the Colosseum, 
excuse me, begging, begging Perpetua to deny Christ so that she could get out of jail and come back home. And she has this, she has this wonderful conversation with her dad, at the same time heartbreaking. And she holds up uh, a vase and she says, is there any other way that we can call this vase anything but a vase? And her dad says no. And she says, I can't call myself anything else besides a Christian. You can't change the nature of what I am. And he says, but they're going to kill you. They may even kill your son. And she says, but I am a Christian. And I can't deny that I am. And that's what Jesus is kind of talking about here. There's going to be a time, he's, he's looking in the future, where families disagree about being committed to Christ. And Jesus is bringing about revolutionary change in the first century. Number one, he's saying that mothers and daughters are going to have the ability to fuss with each other. In the Greek world and even in the Near Eastern world of Judaism, that wasn't really allowed to happen, right? Perpetua was the daughter of, of this man. We don't learn anything really about her mom whatsoever, right? So this is an argument not that she's having with her mom, she's having it with her dad, because the dad is the pater familia. He's in charge of everything. He makes all decisions for the entire household. He makes all the decisions for his children, for his wife or wives, for all of their slaves. Anybody that's a part of that household, that person makes a decision. But Jesus is saying, no, moms are going to be able to have the ability to fight. Daughters are going to be able to have the ability to fight. They're going to be empowered to take a stand and say that they believe in Christ. And so he speaks of division within the household. And these divisions are things that probably just flew right over the head of most of the listeners. But by the second century, Perpetua will probably look to this lection and said, this is what Christ was talking about. For me to not deny Christ, that's going to be painful. There's going to be a fire that I have to walk through with my family. And this is a tough thing. This is, this is a tough statement that you have to be this committed. Jesus is saying no to the patrimony. This will lead to Paul writing the book of Ephesians, where most of us uh, who think that women are important think that Paul is this terrible misogynist. That's not what's happening at all. In Ephesians, he's saying the woman has just as much right in the family to make decisions and support the husband as the husband does. That's breaking with years and years and years of women not being worth anything. We're looking at it through our 20th and 21st century eyes, but he's really empowering women, as was Christ. Giving women the kind of leadership where they could stand up to a man and say, no, I am a Christian. I am a follower of Christ. It's painful, and it's caustic, and it's divisive. Jesus, I think, did come to bring about a peace, but the peace also causes division. It's a peace that passes all understanding. It's a peace that we have within our own soul of how our relationship with Christ is leading us to be different in the world. It's not a peace that can be truly won. It's something that has to be integrated and it transforms and it brings about the opposite of what is the standard way of doing things. The burning away, the washing away, it's a, it's a gift from the kingdom of God, but it's an outcome that I think is a great irony. I also think it's ironic that this text brings about images that we probably all fear. Destruction of fire and water. If you were ever to play a game with uh, kids in your neighborhood or something like that, we used to play this game when I was a youth director called Would You Rather? Have you ever played Would You Rather? A few of you probably have. Would you rather die by fire or by drowning? It's one of the first questions we asked every time, whenever we would start the game. Which way would you rather die? How many of you would rather die by fire? 
How many of you would rather drown? How many of you want to play something else? Right? Okay? Like, th- those are two of the worst ways I could ever imagine perishing. Right? Drowning or burning up. And yet Jesus throws both of those things into this text and says, these things that you know, you, you're aware of the pain of this. You're aware of the challenge of this. In God's time, that's what has to happen. With God, this change is and should be welcomed, yet it's going to cause strife. And here's how that kind of lives now within the church. It lived this way back then, and it lives that way now, this way now. I'm not going to ask for a show of hands on this one. But have you ever heard in church, we've never done it that way before? <laughs> have you ever heard that? Okay, let me try another one on you. We've always done it this way. Have you ever said that? Don't do you don't raise your hand. This is going to set a precedent. Have you ever heard that in a session? We're going to have a session meeting. That may happen. That may say, we may say something. Or this breaks with tradition. See, all of those arguments were probably made when Jesus was preaching. All of those women that heard Jesus say those things that were like, oh my gosh, he included us, we get to fight? I mean, we're not going to get whipped with belts and punished? We get to have our voice will be heard? And then the husband probably said, nope. It's not what's going to happen. People are overly cautious. We're overly pragmatic. We're abundantly skeptical. And I, I think that that's, I think that's a healthy way for us to be in life. But every Sunday I say something to you. And, and I, hope, I hope that when you hear it today in a different context than what I usually say it, that it'll start to make a little bit of sense of why I repeat this every Sunday. In Christ's coming, God was reconciling the world to himself. Our old life is gone, and a new life remains. That's the purpose of Christ on earth. Our old life is gone, and a new life remains. We have to die to self and selfish desires. So when Jesus said, it's not peace that I bring, what he really was trying to say is it's not about your peace or your peace or your peace. It's it's never been about an individual person's peace. In fact, it's not about us at all. Jesus really didn't come, like when you think about this, we think maybe singularly that Jesus came to save me. Man, you got to think highly of yourself to think that that's why Christ came. I'm not that important for Christ to come to earth. But we, as a creation of God, are very important. And Jesus says, I'm not bringing peace. It's about God's kingdom coming into this world. And when Jesus made that make sense to him, to them, what did they do? They killed him. Because they couldn't handle the thought of life being any different. What I love really most about being Presbyterian is that we, from the beginning, from the formation of our way of thinking as a Christian organization, I'm terrible with Latin, but ecclesia reformata, semper reformanda. Does anybody know what that means? The church reformed, always reforming. We're never supposed to be stagnant. We're never just supposed to be like, oh, it's over. We're free at last. Christ is always calling us to be changing, to be meeting the needs of the society in which we find ourselves living. 
And sometimes it's going to be us that have to bring the fire for the refinement or us that have to bring out the baptism of water so that there can be a decomposition of change and discomfort. We worship a God of change and discomfort. Won't you come be set on fire with me? Won't you come drown your sorrows with me? I'll end with this. Probably my favorite text in all of the book of Romans is from Romans 6. And growing up as a Baptist, anytime that somebody would be baptized, Romans 6 was often quoted. And so, you know, they don't have this, right? How many of you have been to a Baptist church and seen a baptism? Have you ever seen that? There's a baptistry, right? And so you walk down in the water uh, and you, you know, you, you say some magic words and then you dunk the person and you bring them back up, right? <clears throat> the imagery that I love the most from Romans chapter 6, therefore we were buried with Christ in a death like his and arise to a new life with Christ in a new life like his. And so as these people were being baptized, the imagery is that you were buried to death with Christ and you go under the water and you arise to a new life in Christ. Now it's not about the water. It's not how much water is there. It's not about whether or not you're fully immersed or sprinkled. That's not really what I'm talking about. But the imagery of seeing someone go down, being laid down, being put to death, their old life being crucified and then raising to a new life was imagery that's etched into my mind almost as importantly as all of those times I saw my dad get on that fire truck. What Christ's call is in this world is a call to be different today than we were yesterday. To be better today than we were yesterday. To constantly be renewed by the renewing of our hearts and our souls and our mind and our strength to let Christ lead us and guide us and direct us where to go. Not about what we want, but what about Christ is calling us to be. Church, that's hard. It's not fun. It's painful. I hope I don't preach this text again for four years, right? <laughs> but we need to recognize that if we're going to be Christians this year and next year and the year after next, we have to be doing something to help make the world a better place through the love of Christ. Not because we're good citizens, not because we're good people, but because Christ is calling us to radically, radically change and alter the world. Will you be scared to death with me? May it be so in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen, and amen. Let us stand and declare that which we believe in the recitation of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. At this time, it's uh, time for us to continue our worship by the giving of our tithes and offerings. <laughs>
pray. Holy and gracious God, we thank you so much for the many gifts and blessings that you have given to us in this life. Lord, as we return a portion of these gifts to you now, we ask for you to give us your vision on how we should use these gifts best for our community. All this we say in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. You may be seated. I have a few uh, prayer requests to share with you uh, this morning. Uh, Hopefully you've uh, been praying for Miss Donna's sister, Diane Baldwin. Um, Diana, sorry, not Diane. Uh, She's staying with Mike and Donna at the house. Uh, She's uh, several forms of cancer, and so she's uh, being cared for by Miss Donna at home. Uh, Kathy Weed's brother in Greensboro, uh, David Willoughby, is uh, having some tests. And I guess a test tomorrow, did you say? Is that what you said? He already had one. Okay, he had one. Okay. For, they're waiting for the results of some testing. So please, uh, please be in prayer for David. Also, Kim and Keith have a meeting tomorrow uh, to talk about their son. I uh, hope everything goes well and hopefully get their, their daughters back and home with them as well. But uh, Wayne, little Wayne, has been acting out a bit in foster care. And so they have a meeting about that tomorrow. Okay, and they've got a picture of, of little, little Wayne as well. It's a, it's, a tough, it's a tough, tough situation. Let's bring all of our thoughts and our requests together as we lift them to our Lord and to our Savior. Let us pray. Holy and gracious God, we come to you right now just thankful for your grace, your mercy, and for your love. Holy God, we, we come to you and we're thankful for the words that you provide for us. Words of encouragement, but also, Lord, words that require action. We know, Lord, that you came to make alterations to life that were called to be different each day through your grace and through your mercy. God, refine us, deliver us, and create for us, Lord, clean hearts that we may go into your world and do your will. God, we're thankful that we live in this country where we have the freedom to come together and worship. We know that that's not a right that's afforded to all humans. We're thankful for that, Lord. We pray also, God, for our sisters and brothers who gather today out of fear of persecution, suffering, imprisonment, or even death. God, we don't know them by name, but we know that they gather to worship you. Give them a sense of hope and peace. Give them security. We're thankful, Lord, for the men and women who have historically fought to keep our country free. We're thankful, Lord, for those whom we call veteran. We're mindful, Lord, of the men and women who are still in part of our armed forces this day. We pray for their safety. We pray, Lord, for their safe return home. We pray, Lord, for a day where peace is the order of the day. God, because you ask us to do this, we do so even though we don't always understand. But we know that you ask us to pray also for our enemies. And so we do so at the same time. We pray, Lord, for the tensions arising around Taiwan. We pray, Lord, for the hostilities in Ukraine. We pray for peace. We pray, Lord, for the families who have lost nearly everything in eastern Kentucky. Pray for the families out west who are experiencing droughts. We pray, Lord, for all of your creation, that they would seek to know you. We ask, God, that you would use us to be your hands and feet in this world. We pray today, Lord, for Diana as she is being cared for by her sister. We pray for David as he and his wife and family await results of testing. Pray for Kathy as she prays from afar for her brother. We pray for Kim and Keith and for their family. We pray for little Wayne. We pray, Lord, for peace. We pray, God, for children who will begin school this week, for college students who have been dropped off, 
for families who are experiencing an empty nest. God, we pray for your will to be done in all of our lives. Pray, Lord, for those who have answered the call to the ministry of healing, that they may be healers. God, because we are a community of faith, we pray for those who are seated to our right and to our left, in front of us and behind us. In the stillness of this moment, Lord, we pray for ourselves. Holy God, we are amazed by your grace and the glory of your ways. We thank you for sending your son to earth, that he showed us how to live and taught us also to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Please stand as you are able for our closing hymn, hymn number 828, More Love to Thee, O Christ. You know, one of the challenges, I think, of looking at a text like this uh, and trying to preach from it is there's about 500 other things that I wanted to say uh, in this sermon to have it make sense, but it's already 11-something, right?
11.05, so we talked about it enough. Uh, suffice it to say, there was a whole bunch more that I would like to have, have said because I wanted to make sure that, that this one makes sense. I don't want it to be taken out of context. I don't want it to be something that uh, upsets us or discourages us. But I want it to be something also that we recognize the challenge of what the gospel is calling us to do. It's calling us to be refined, to be different, to be changed, to be altered. If we are still the same today as we were five weeks ago, that's probably okay. Right? But if we're the same today that we were five years ago, that's on us. We have to constantly be looking at how Christ is calling us to be renewed, refined, and regenerated. So let's look for that. Let's look for ways for Christ to constantly be altering us so that we can meet the demands of this world. Amen? Now receive the blessing of the triune God, the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. May he be with us all until we meet again, either here or his glorious kingdom come. Amen and amen. Happy Sunday.